So the company has a novel aero architecture. We call it Tilt Aircraft eVTOL. So electric vertical takeoff and landing. But we don't have rotating wings. We don't have rotating motors or motors pushing motors. So it's inherently very simple, uh, lower cost, higher reliability. It's very easy to learn how to fly and it's a joy to fly. So FAA has a regulatory carve out, if you will. It's a, it's, a, it's a section of the FAR called Part 103. And Part 103 defines that which is an ultralight aircraft. And ultralight aircraft come with a lot of restrictions. You can only operate them in G airspace. You can only operate them over non-congested or non-settled areas. So we're not talking about anything that's be flying over a city or near a busy airport. So the Blackfly is the third generation of a now pre-production vehicle, which will always be our, our developmental heritage. Uh, about two dozen vehicles built and flown over the years, again, in development for over a decade, with thousands and thousands of flight test sessions. Well, today we announced you know, what the production vehicle, the successor to Blackfly looks like. It's called the Helix. It's painted with a beautiful livery and it, uh, it's substantially different from the Black Fly. We kept what we call the outer mold line or the fundamental aerodynamics the same. Uh, the structure is entirely new, made from different composite materials. Uh, we took substantial weight out of the structure and we did that to make room for the kind of accessories and functionality that someone buying an asset like this would, would come to expect. Beacon lights, aviation radios, obviously the, the, the custom livery on the outside. As it turns out naked black carbon is, uh, gets a little hot in the summer sun and it uh, also doesn't necessarily weather for years and years and years. So there's that. We've added substantial margin to the propulsion system so owners will be able to fly at higher density altitudes and will likely be raising the uh, payload limit, which today sits at only 200 pounds. There's about 35,000 ultralights already in North America, so we think there's room for thousands more per year. A lot of them are just gonna do it for recreation. You know, people buy ATVs and snowmobiles for recreation. Polaris is a $4 billion company. So recreation and fun is a pretty necessary aspect of life, I'd say. But more importantly, we'll be building out an install base of cloud-connected eVTOLs where we're able to understand performance of the aircraft, operator behavior, uh, energy management, part wear, battery wear, and so many things. We think that's gonna position us really well for that next stage, which would be a larger aircraft, likely to be certified under the FAA's forthcoming mosaic construct when that actually becomes law. Misty Copeland, thank you so much for speaking with Forbes. Thank you. So we are speaking at an event dedicated to mentorship among women, and you wrote an entire book dedicated mm -hmm. to your mentor, Raven. For those who have not read it, who is she? What do people need to know? Yes, Raven Wilkinson. Um, was the first and only black woman to dance with this legendary company, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. It was really one of the most important ballet companies of the 20th century. Um, she experienced um, a severe racism, her life being threatened, um, just so she could get on stage and perform. This was whenever the company would tour through the South in the 1950s. Um, she went on to become a soloist in the company, which is such a feat as a dancer, period, but as a black woman, even more so. Um, her career was cut short in America because of uh, you know, Jim Crow South and segregation um, and in that time. So it was just too difficult for her to tour with the company in that time. So she ended up moving to Europe where she finished her career. Um, she came into my life um, at a very critical time in my career where I was uh, you know, at a crossroads of figuring out um, if this was something I wanted to stick with and do in classical ballet. I was the only black woman at American Ballet Theater for the first 10 years of my career. Um, and to have uh, a mentor come into my life and set such a positive example for me and 
constantly come from a place of love um, was a very new experience. Um, you know, I've had incredible mentors in my life um, and examples from afar, but um, it's hard, you know, you develop a tough skin when you're the only and when you've um, come up against this wall, you know, over and over again, being black and brown in an industry that you don't see yourself represented and to meet someone who um, had such a positive outlook on, um, on this field of classical ballet and what was still possible, it gave me a completely different perspective on um, where I wanted my career to go and how I was going to approach things. Um, that it was about being an example and being a role model and, um, and being open to this idea of mentorship, both being one um, and having them in, in my life. How did you find her? What was the mm -hmm. moment? Because I think for me, mentors have come organically. It's been someone who hires me and I end up trusting mm -hmm. their advice or someone who edits a story and I like the edit and then right. I realize I, I keep going to them for counsel. Yeah. What was the evolution for you? Um, so I saw a documentary with Raven in it and, um, and it just, it was eye-opening to see someone who um, had experienced, I mean, so much worse than I could ever even imagine, you know, that I've experienced in my own career. But to, um, to see that there was still so much that hadn't changed, um, I just felt that I, I needed someone like her in my life to communicate what it was she experienced and, and be um, a source of community for me and at a very important time. And so my manager and I, um, we were on a mission. We were like, we have to find this woman. We hope she's still alive. Um, and found out she lived a block away from me in New York City and, um, and reached out to her. And the first time we met was um, at a panel discussion about two different generations of black dancers. It was at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And from there on, we were inseparable. Um, and it was just so, you know, important for me to, I think, understand the importance of mentorship. I mean, I'd, I've had mentors, you know, throughout my career and have been um, so fortunate to have people that have come to me uh, and, and wanted to lend their advice and experiences. Um, uh, so I feel like all of that prepared me for Raven to be ready and open to accept all the gifts that she was giving. A block away, talk about meant to be. Yeah. What's your advice to someone whose mentor is perhaps not waiting for them, a block away? Do you have mm -hmm. one tip for someone who's like, I feel like I need a mentor, I just don't know where to look? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the first step is, is acknowledging and, um, and accepting and being open that um, mentorship is important. I think for a lot of young people, um, they're, they're not even aware that mentors may be right there or approaching them because they're not open and ready for it or they feel like um, it's you know them failing or being weak by needing help or guidance or advice. And I think that's kind of the first step is, is accepting that um, having a, a community is empowering. Um, and then go out there and look, go out there and you know whether it's, um, reading, um, just looking in places, uh, people that motivate you, people that are inspiring, and not being afraid to reach out and, and put in that, that legwork. And that's how I found Raven. I consider you a multi-hyphenate, obviously, ballerina, writer, but also advocate and activist. The last time we spoke was for the Forbes Women's Summit. I think it was the last time. I'll have to fact check this. But <laughs> the Women's Summit, a virtual summit in 2020, we were coming off a summer of social justice protests, mm -hmm. companies and individuals making all these pledges to do better. Nearly three years later, what's your report card? How's the world doing? <laughs> you know, I, I have to say that I feel like we're still on on a positive trajectory um, in terms of uh, changes really happening in the classical ballet world. Um, I, there's still so much that, that needs to change, but um, even just looking at a, a lot of top-tiered companies around the world um, 
who have had new artistic staff come on, artistic leadership. So many women have come into power in these classical companies that I, I think we have more women in um, artistic and executive director positions than I've ever seen in the classical ballet world in, in our history. Um, in terms of race um, and you know dealing with those, those issues, I mean, I look at there was an article that came out recently just about the evolution of um, allowing dancers of color to go on stage in tights that are their skin color. That's a true representation and acceptance of who they are on stage um, and not saying that you have to be white in order to um, fit into this classical ballet idea ideal. Um, and so that's a huge step, but I think that it's uh, continuing to having, have the conversations and hold people you know, accountable. And that's something that I will forever continue to do. It's, I've seen the appointments kind of behind the scenes. I am someone who frequents the theater in New York City and I feel like, I won't name any companies, but there was one production where I was looking and I was like, I thought the company was more diverse than this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it feels like it's, maybe I'm impatient, you should be. You should be impatient. <laughs> I think that's how you, um, you know, you push people and 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 get change. But I don't think that we should settle in in just seeing a handful of uh, dancers of color. And then you know there there may be certain performances where all of those dancers are off. Right. And that's not okay. Um, so you know I, there's still so much work to be done. And. Um, and I hope that you know programs like the Be Bold program through the Misty Copeland Foundation will create a pipeline of more dancers of color um, to you know have a larger pool of dancers of color to choose from to go into these uh, classical companies. Speaking of Be Bold, I mean you wrote this in a book, but I think it might tie to the mission of Be Bold. You'll have to tell me if that's right. Mm -hmm. But you wrote to be marginalized from a culture is to be marginalized from citizenship. Mm -hmm. Does that tie to Be Bold? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's really about um, showing that ballet, it, it's normalizing this elite art form. It's normalizing it, especially in America, where, you know, it, it, going to the ballet or going to the opera, that should be like going to see Beyonce in concert. That should be like going to a basketball game. Um, this should be something for everyone. It should be a community that's, that's um, embracing all communities um, and all cultures. And uh, through the Be Bold program, which is an after-school uh, ballet program, it's for free. It's at uh, community centers right now. We're starting out at, at the Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, but it's, it's, it's introducing children to um, really understanding what classical dance is, what classical music is, by uh, meeting them where they are. Uh, so, you know, we're introducing them to live instruments. Every class has a live musician in there and two teaching artists as well. So there's a, a team of three people that are in the room so that they can really focus and nurture and be there for these dancers. Um, but it's not just about creating, you know, the next Misty Copeland. It's about um, creating uh, future patrons. It's just, it's about um, opening their eyes to this art form and showing them what's possible. It's igniting, um, you know, what it is to be a part of a team, what it is to have focus and determination and drive and, um, and uh, to be dedicated to something, to find a passion. And I think that this is a beautiful gateway to doing that, to creating future Future leaders. It absolutely, I have a theory, and maybe this is because I danced as a kid, but ballet infuses you with so many skills that mm -hmm. you can use. I talked to so many founders and leaders, yes. and we get to talking, and they're like, oh yeah, I danced all through college mm -hmm. too. And there's, it's the discipline. Yes. I, we could have a whole separate <laughs> conversation, but talking about how the skills of ballet translate to other things. I don't want to use the R word because we're here at an <laughs> event talking about how careers are evolutions and have yes. chapters, but yes. when your body is your instrument for your job, there are certain limitations. How do you think about the evolution of your career? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is something that's always been uh, a part of my evolution, um, is, is thinking about how I can utilize, you know, all that I've learned by being a classical dancer and taking it a step further. I've, I've never looked at my career as be, being on stage, being the end all be all, but um, just a, a, you know, another layer of, of what it is to, um, 
to have the responsibility of carrying on, you know, so many people's legacies and stories as a black woman um, within this field. And so I've been working on what the next steps in my journey will be. Uh, I feel like I've been doing that, that work my whole professional ballet career, and I'm never gonna leave this behind. I may step down from the stage eventually, um, but I will forever be an advocate and bringing uh, you know, ballet into different worlds that I'm in, you know, whether it's through the foundation, whether it's through my production company, where we're um, show, giving a different perspective and lens to what it is to be um, an artist, um, real authentic stories by having people behind the scenes telling those stories who have lived that experience, women of color um, telling important stories, but it's all connected to my experience of being a ballet dancer. And I'm just so fortunate that I've had people who have pushed me to step outside of my comfort zone um, and think about what my evolution will look like. I think you're setting the stage beautifully, but when you think about the way a body can change. Mm -hmm. We've had women on the 50 over 50. Lillian Cologne was the first Latina Rocket. She mm -hmm. was on, and then she was in West Side Story, yeah. and uh, then was the oldest person in that cast, made the 50 over 50. So I know you can dance into your 60s, 70s, and 80s, but the way you dance changes. And yes. I think that I've experienced that myself, and it's hard it's hard. It's hard. How do you? How do you? It's hard at forty right now. <laughs> um, it's you know, of course, it's about taking care of yourself and and um, and you know, I'm I'm an athlete and and you know, taking care of my body in a way that um, you know, whether it's what I'm feeding it, fueling it. Um, the cross training that I'm doing, the the time for recovery and and healing, but I think it's also um, it's also like a, a preference, you know. I want to um, be able to use my time in a way where I feel like I can have impact in other ways, and I feel like I've I've you know I've been on the stage for 23 years, and I feel like. I want to give this opportunity now to the next generation. I think it's about passing the torch and, and being able to put myself in a place where I can have a, a, a big impact as well. And I feel like that's kind of um, what it, where I'm getting to right now. I see that. And I think you can pass the torch both ways. I just mentioned Lillian Cologne. We had Joan Myers Brown with oh, Alan Bone I go on the list. Yes. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but who would you nominate? From dance or otherwise, for the next class of 50 over 50. Oh my goodness. Um, Virginia Johnson. She was um, one of the first principal ballerinas for the Dance Theater of Harlem um, in the 60s. And uh, she took over Dance Theater of Harlem as artistic director when it uh, came off of a seven-year hiatus after Arthur Mitchell stepped down, um, who was the founder of Dance Theater of Harlem and the first black principal dancer for New York City Ballet. Um, she's an incredible woman who has made such an impact, not just on the black ballet community, but on the ballet world at large. Well, we will consider that nomination for the 50 over 50. And with that, we will let you go. Misty, thank you so much for thank sitting down you. with us. Thank you so much for having me. The top handbag collectors in the world are interested in handbags made by Hermes. Hermes um, is a designer brand today, but it was founded in 1837 as a harness workshop. In the 1880s, um, Hermes expanded into saddles, and then at the turn of the century, when the automobile was invented, it was very important for Hermes to diversify their offerings in order to maintain relevance in this changing world. And one of the pieces that um, were, were created by Hermes were handbags. I am the head of sales here at Sotheby's for handbags and accessories. Uh, we have both a buy now and an auction platform for our handbags and accessories. Sotheby's is the premier destination for luxury and artwork. Um, for us in handbags and accessories, we established ourselves in 2018 with our very first auction. Um, and then we launched our buy now platform in 2020. So one thing that differentiates us from um, other competitors is that we offer both buy now and auction for our clients. So the Birkin has been around since 1984 um, and it's named after Jane Birkin, who is a French um, celebrity 
who met actually at the time the creative director um, for Hermes and family member. The Hermes Birkin is one of the most collectible bags made by Hermes. It was designed in the 1980s. Um, it was created when Jane Birkin was seated next to an Hermes executive on a, on a flight. She had her signature straw tote bag. She was shoving it in an overhead compartment and it fell out, it tumbled out, everything fell to the floor. And the gentleman sitting next to her said, why don't you have a bag with pockets? And she said, I will when Hermes makes me one. She just ha so happened to be sitting next to the CEO of Hermes. Um, and the two of them together sketched up the idea of the Birkin bag. This was in 1984 and three years later, this bag was then released to the public. It, you know, has a cult following. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, the easiest to use bag, the thing that, you know, is such a symbol of, you know, status for some people. My responsibilities at Christie's include advising clients around the world on their handbag collections. I put together handbag auctions, whether it's from one single client or from multiple clients, put together to, to create sales during special moments at Christie's, like luxury week, I advise clients on their purchases. The one great thing about a Birkin is its silhouette will never change, essentially. Um, it's classic in every sense of the word, but one of the things that they're known for is the different sizes and colors. So um, each season they release a new size, a new color, um, and that's kind of what people look for when they're trying to um, find one of the Birkins for themselves. And the designers that created these handbags 50 years ago, 100 years ago, were ingenious and they've created iconic forms that today are still resonating with collectors and handbag shoppers around the world. It's iconic because when you look at it, it doesn't scream Hermes, it doesn't scream a brand, but you know that it's a Birkin and you know that it's Hermes. So, um, you know, it's hard to obtain because there's only so many made each year and the want for it kind of outweighs the accessibility. Pieces are made in such such a uh, exquisite way that uh, not only is it the materials and the craftsmen that are expert in this is in this method, and the, these forms are essential. So the Birkin looks exactly as it did in the 1980s. The Kelly has the same form as it did when it was first created in the 1930s. And if you purchase one of these pieces, not only will the condition stay in an exquisite form, but also the style will never um, become outdated. You know, the Birkin really has been able to stand the test of time, um, and it's really due to how classic it is. You know, even though trends come and go, um, because it is something that is so beautifully made and it is so classic, it's been able to really outlive some of its other competitors. So um, one of the most expensive bags sold at Sotheby's, um, we have an example of it here, is the Himalaya Kelly. Um, in our auction that happened this past September, um, we had one um, hammer for 350,000 roughly. You know, and with this sale, Sotheby's set a record for a handbag being sold at auction within the United States and Europe. The thing about handbags are they're such personal objects and it's such a reflection on your own style, perhaps your job, where you live, that, um, that there really is something for everyone. Mo Avadu, thank you for being here. You are on our Power Women list. You are on the 50 over 50. You are Netflix's biggest partner in Africa right now, founder of Ebony Life Media. You didn't start there. You weren't always an entrepreneur. I wasn't always. I f First of all, thank you so much for having me and for having this conversation and for this special event today and for celebrating all the amazing women and bringing us together. You know, it's really... It's been really inspiring and encouraging to just to see so many different women together who are all doing different things, but the common purpose is that we just want to just add value to whatever it is that we're doing. And you so are adding value. So you spent most of your career working in oil and gas and HR. Yeah, so yeah, so I hadn't, I've not always been an entrepreneur, but I think deep within me, I've always felt like an entrepreneur. And they say that the, the definition of an entrepreneur is t risk taking, right? So I have this amazing job at ExxonMobil. Um, I'd been there for a decade, head of human resources. And then I just wake up one fine day, 10 years later, and I'm like, I'm ready to go. And everybody thought, are you okay? I mean, you don't have such a great job with career prospects like that and then decide that you're gonna go. But I just felt like there was this thing within me that just wanted to do more. Was it risky? Was I afraid? Was I scared? I was all those things, but I just wasn't going to leave it there. I decided to just take the plunge, and I left my wonderful nine-to-five paying job, and I decided that 
go out there and make it happen. And it wasn't straight into media. Right. I set up a consulting firm called Vic Lawrence and Associates. So what I, what I was doing on the inside, I decided to do on the outside. So it was basically offering HR services because I realized that there was a gap in the market whilst I was at Exxon for what I was doing, you know, in terms of recruitment and training and development and capacity building. There just weren't enough people on the other side doing that. So was it risky? It was still risky. Mm -hmm. But I, I decided that I was going to go out there and face it. And thankfully, it worked until the bigger idea came to leave consulting and jump into media. So again, everybody's like, but Mo, why are you doing this? You left Exxon. Vic Lawrence is doing great. Now you're going to leave Vic Lawrence and go and get into the world of media. And I started with a talk show. And coming from the continent, you know, talk shows are considered like, why are you going to leave Exxon Mobil, why are you going to leave your consulting practice to go and become a TV presenter, is how it was coined. And they weren't seeing the bigger picture, that this was just basically the anchor project for me to even go further and further into the world of media. Way back in 2000, 2003, 2004, local content wasn't a big deal. Mm. We were still very much involved in whatever you Americans gave us, fed us, we took it not realizing how important it was for us to tell our own stories, generate our own content, talk about our own superstars, make our own superstars, and talk about things that are in our society. Now, I often say that, I, I mean, I love Oprah Winfrey. I love her show. But really and truly, how relevant is what she, whatever she's talking about, how relevant is that to the average woman in Nigeria or anywhere on the continent? They may be able to take some high-level advice from her. But if you're really dealing with, let's say, for example, your husband beats you and she has a show in America that says, call this helpline. A Nigerian can't call that helpline. She needs a local helpline to call. And there are tons and tons of women in Nigeria who are doing great work in this area. So it was about creating a platform for such things, not forgetting about our superstars who want to become models, who want to become actresses, who want to become whatever it is they want to become, giving them a platform to shine. So it was, for me, the talk show was a jump off point for whereby we could start to have that conversation around things that are important to us as Africans. We are a billion people. We do need to be able to tell our own stories, you know, and if we don't, someone else is going to tell them for us. You make a compelling argument, but I know we talked about how when you started out, I mean, you're working with Netflix now, now. but you were having, what was it, a lot of great meetings that went nowhere, the oh, typical yes. Hollywood oh, experience? Oh my God, the Hollywood experience is lovely. They say there's never a bad meeting in Hollywood. <laughs> Everybody smiles and then you sort of, you know, have champagne or you have wine and it's smiley, smiley, kiss, kiss, kiss here and there. We'll be in touch. And you collect the business cards and you send the emails and nothing happens and it's one story after the other. So, yes, we went through many years of, of that and I think it's powerful, the course, that you're going to go through that. But the thing is, are you going to give up? It's about being at the right place at the right time and being able to tell the right story at the right time where the world is ready to listen. Now, am I saying that all is well today? All is not well. But is there definitely um, an improvement on the situation from what it was before, 100%. Now, are most of the gatekeepers and the commissioners still, you know, um, white men, um, middle-aged white men? Very much so. Are they beginning to listen? Some of them. Are we getting more and more black commissioners or commissioners of color? It's beginning to change. So that's the work in progress. So for me, I mean, I've been going to a market called MIP TV and MIPCOM in Cannes for the last 10 years. The conversation has changed. People are beginning to listen because commercial forces are making them listen. I'm not making a case here for an agenda or a charity case or an NGO-based case. No, I'm making a commercial case for the fact that storytelling for everyone around the world, no matter where they're from, is important because there are markets around the world for you to, you know, to buy into. And Netflix, to go back, were the first ones to realize that there's a market there's an Africa market. So I'd been knocking on Netflix's door before they came to Africa, you know, and they weren't listening when they weren't ready. But the minute that they were ready, because I'd been knocking and knocking and knocking, obviously, you know, we were able to sort of continue those conversations whereby it became, okay, Mo, let's do a slate deal. So, you know, we, we're happy to say that we are, we are the first, you know, company to have a multi-slate deal with Netflix across the continent. And um, I think they're happy with the progress we're making. And um, we'll continue to just 
give them as many blockbusters as we can because it's all about the numbers. It's about mm. them coming into co to, to the continent and building their subscriber base. And we're there to help them do that. You can only do that by creating great stories that the world wants to see. Now for Netflix, of course, primarily the audience is we want a Nigerian market, we want an African market. But I want to play in a global space. And that's why we now have grown out of not just having Netflix as a partner, but reaching out to other co-production partners that we have to include Sony Pictures Television, Stars, Lionsgate, Will Packer, Westbrook, the BBC. You know, it's taken everything. You know, Maggie, it's taken everything because you're sometimes just knocking. And the worst thing is when someone just says, we're going to respectfully pass. Mm. It's the worst email you're ever going to get because you believe in this project. You can see it, but they can't always see it. So it, it, it can take some convincing and some persuasion for them to see that there's a story there. But we keep knocking. And the more we do, the easier it becomes. How do you keep convincing them? Is there a secret to what you say or is it just the persistence? It's, 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 I think it's how you package. Um, it's how you present. It's how you pitch. Um, it's trying to give them stories that are unusual. It's hoping that you've got someone at the other end that has a listening ear, that got out of bed the right side that particular day. Um, you know, it's all those things. It's really emotional intelligence. It's, are they ready to take a chance on you, on a different type of story? So there's so many boxes to tick. But I think that once success has been identified, and we've seen that with Wakanda Forever and you know, and that black stories do matter and that foreign stories do matter with Squid Games and other stories that are even not in even in English language but are doing really well, you know. So it's, by, it's, it's getting them to buy into that and using those as examples to say, listen, there is this case study, there is that case study. Come on, guys, take a risk. And we're not saying give us the budgets you're giving them in America or in the UK. Yes, we want bigger budgets, don't, don't get me wrong. Because you can't give me $2 and give the other person $100 and then compare my $2 show to their $100 million show. Mm. I mean, come on. You know, so so it, it is about, you know, give us a decent budget so we can produce a decent show that the world is going to appreciate. Like, so they're beginning to listen. Listening is good. <laughs> there can always be more. Always good. You talk about partnerships. I know you have some news about a new <laughs> partnership that we're breaking some news right now. Yes, Tell us yes, what yes. We are breaking some news and I'm excited to say that in partnership with Idris Elba and his company Green Door Pictures, we are going to be working on two major areas. Area 1 or Category 1 or Project 1 um, is going to be taking the Ebony Life Creative Academy model that's been in existence for the last three years and taking that out across the continent. One thing we do need to do is to empower and to upskill filmmakers across the continent. If we don't do that, they're never going to be able to compete globally. So it's important to go in there and give them the necessary skills. So they're going to be offering courses in production, producing, script writing, directing, cinematography, sound. Um, you know, these are acting. So we have eight courses we're going to be rolling out. So the Ebony Life Creative Academy currently rolls this out now. So it's taking that model and replicating it across the continent. So that's what Idris Elba and I and his company are going to be doing. We're excited about it. I think our focus is going to be more sub-Saharan Africa because mm -hmm. that's really you know, where we're from and we think, and you can't do everything and you can't be there for everyone. So it's really about sort of taking that part of, the, of, of Africa and rolling out there. We're going to be reaching out to private sector. We're going to be reaching out to multilateral agencies. We're going to be reaching out to governments to say, listen, you all have a responsibility to empower the youth and to empower this particular sector, let's find ways of working together to make that happen. Um, the current model that we have is Ebony Life working with the Lagos state government without their support, wouldn't be able to you know, be running these programs mm -hmm. because all our students come, it's free of charge. If you put the barrier there that they must pay for these courses, I don't think the uptake is going to be there because they can't afford it. We're trying to say, let's empower these filmmakers. So they need to be able to come on those courses at no charge. So that's why we're going to be reaching out to you know, various people and organizations to say, please, let's do this together. So that's project one. Project two is... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's project one. Okay, that yeah. was project one. That was yeah, a lot. That's okay, a lot. and then there's a second part. The second project is global productions, black storytelling 
about taking our local stories from Africa and making them global. Um, finding really interesting stories of the world that you, Maggie, wants to watch, that Tracy in Essex wants to watch. But she's interested in hearing that story from the continent that's speaking to us, but also speaking to her or speaking to him. So it's, it's, it's going to be the academy on the one side and global storytelling on the other side. And we're going to be you know, hopefully partnering with streamers and broadcasters around the world to take some of those stories on. That's so, incredible. How did yeah. this start? Did you meet at an industry event? No, or? we did not meet at an industry event. Um, Idris was interested in the academy, the Creative Academy. And um, our Creative Academy had reached out to him to say, would he come and speak? Because what we also do is we invite in faculty, external faculty or guest speakers to address our students. So you could be, it could be the acting class, it could be the producing class, it could be any of the classes, the directing class. Of course, Idris is an actor. So we said, would you please, you know, so someone at the school called Michael, Michael, hi, I'm not forgetting you. Michael reached out to Idris to say, Idris, would you please come and speak to our students? So Idris said he had heard about the great work that we were doing at the school and he would love to, but can I also, I would like to meet Mo. So I get a call from Michael saying, Michael, um, Idris Elba would like to meet you. Can I give him your number? Can you give him my number? Hello? Yes, you can give him my number. <laughs> So um, he sent me a message saying, well, good afternoon, very polite, you know, um, can, we, can we speak at 5 p.m. on that day? And I was like, yes, of course. If I, whatever I was doing, I would have happily you, said, you drop, I would have it, dropped it. Yes. I said, yes, of course we can speak. And we've been speaking and speaking. This was a few months ago. We've been speaking and speaking. And until we signed the deal on working on these two, you know, incredible projects together. Um, Idris did say to me that, Mo, why didn't you reach out to me? And I was like, well, I don't know you. And, you know, you're a big <laughs> actor. I mean, I didn't know if you were, how, I didn't have your contact details. I mean, not that I'm not bold enough to reach out to anyone, but sometimes you just know that at the right time it will come. Um, and um, he's, he's someone that I admire greatly. I have a huge amount of respect for what he's done around the world and a huge amount of respect for what he wants to do in Africa. Now, a lot of, he's not the only African in the diaspora. But for me, he is the one that I have seen that has shown the most love for wanting to come back and work in Africa. Mm. A lot of the African um, actors and producers and directors, they kind of just want to move into the American space or the British space, forgetting about the continent, not realizing sometimes that they actually have a responsibility to help grow the local economy, creative economy and film stars. You know. You know, I think maybe some of them have had such a hard time breaking through. They would rather, now that they've broken through, <laughs> they would rather just stay on that side, not understanding that it's really time for Africa now, and they should look at, if you've had some success, you know, in the diaspora, it's time for you to come back and give some of that back, you know. So Idris is special in that regard, in that he's so successful globally, he doesn't feel any sense of risk, adverse to coming back to, 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 to working with, with, with Africa um, and, 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 and seeing how we can take global black projects to the world. Um, and to say that for those that haven't seen that opportunity, now Will Packer has seen that opportunity, you know, um, Will Smith has seen that opportunity, the BBC have seen that opportunity. So I really want to say to, you know, to African directors and producers and in, in the diaspora that really, guys, we need to find a way of being more inclusive. And we can't keep saying we want to, you know, to be included in what's going on in the rest of the world if, you, if they're also not wanting to participate in what's going on in the continent as well. So, Idris, thank you. I am so, so excited about us working together on these creative academies and finding global, you know, production deals to do with streamers and broadcasters and taking our black stories and African stories to the world. I just can't wait. I can't wait. We can't wait to see it. Mo, thank you so much. Thank you. Andres Valencia is a contemporary artist from California whose work goes for as much as $250,000. The only catch? He's just 11 years old. The child prodigy has been painting since he was five years old, and his work is inspired by art world icons like Jean-Michel Basquiat, George Kondo, and Picasso, as well as kid world icons like click-and-play army action figures and, of course, Pokemon. 
In 2021, Valencia became the youngest artist in the industry to have his own booth at Art Miami. This year, he returned to the fair and sold 11 pieces, fetching a total of $1.3 million. I've been painting a lot of my life. I started painting when I was five or six, and I just always liked art, and it, I just always enjoyed painting and drawing. I like that people enjoy my art, and it's fun going to different art shows. Celebrities like Brooke Shields, Sofia Vergara, and even Kim Taehyung, aka V from BTS, have purchased his work. I have a lot of favorites, so I don't think I have one in particular. I'd have to say Arnold. That one, I added a little something different to it. I got inspired by Moody Giuliani to do the long and thin neck. Well, it was a little shocking that it actually happened, and I felt like I needed to help, so I did that painting. It's basically of what's going on, and there is a soldier attacking the innocent people, and a hand, like an empowerment hand, saying that Ukraine is not going to give up. My dream is to have my art hanging in the Louvre in Paris. Growth and hitting targets isn't the most important measurement of success. I truly believe that building your community and focusing on brand building is far more superior and in the long run is far more successful. I'm Isabella Weatherby, I'm 28 and I'm the founder and creative director of Peachy Den. Peachy Den is a contemporary women's wear brand from London. I founded the company in 2019. We directly addressed the Gen Z market. We built our story around capsule drops. Each of these drops is limited, meaning that we don't overproduce and create waste. And then within each of these drops, we find our star products that we then restock throughout the year and they become our core offering. Our revenue in 2022 was 3.9 million pounds and we have 50,000 customers across 60 countries. Since day one of Peachy, I've been so passionate about making sure that we reflect our essence as a true London born and bred brand. And we are so proud that we produce over 40% of our production in the UK. We work with local and family-run ethical factories across the UK and across Europe. You can have much better control over the production process and minimize waste. I had quite an unconventional start in fashion. I actually studied politics and international relations at university. And then post-uni, I jumped into numerous roles that didn't really make me happy. So Peachy Den actually started as a side hustle. I've kind of always been inspired by what I felt like was missing from my own wardrobe. And it was just such a simple concept. It was genuinely just making clothes that my friends and I wanted to wear. In 2021, I raised 600,000 pounds and I was looking for someone who was strategic and someone who was more going to be a mentor rather than just about the funds, I think. With my unconventional background and potentially lack of experience, I wanted someone that I could really look up to and learn from. So I have a very close relationship with this person and we speak weekly and they've been very strategic in terms of the growth of, of Peachy Den. With the investment, we were able to invest in pop-up spaces across London and also across Paris. This has been an amazing opportunity for us to learn from our customer. In 2021, our product offering was still very tiny. It was about five products. And I think in order to grow, you have to diversify your product offering and really delve into and understand more about what your customer wants. So just investing in stock and investing in relationships. What was amazing from having that investment was being able to grow and build the team bringing in people that complement my skill set. 
Our team is 12 employees, it's 12 women, and we're an incredibly tight net team who inspire and challenge me on a daily basis. Celebrating the female form and prioritizing versatility is at the forefront of the process. We actually have a number of questions up on our board when we're designing into a new capsule. Can this item be worn on a size 6 and a size 18? Can this item be worn to the office and out and about? We really want to create products that after that initial buzz is worn off, that once you get it through the door, it's it still hits the spot and it really takes you from day to night, season to season. If I'm totally honest, I very much think six months to one year ahead. I don't really focus on five to 10 years. I'm so happy with how the company is building and I honestly believe that this is just the beginning. It's such a journey for me and I'm learning as I go and I feel like there is so much more to learn. There is so much more to build on. I want my legacy to be defining the style of a generation. What you're looking at today is Codex Sassoon, one of the world's greatest treasures. The Codex Sassoon is the earliest, most complete Hebrew Bible ever discovered. In May 2023, it will go up for sale at Sotheby's, and it could become the most expensive book or manuscript ever sold at auction. The estimate for Codex Sassoon is 30 to $50 million. This is the highest price that we've ever placed on a book or manuscript, but we believe that this estimate correctly reflects the signal importance of this great treasure. With all great treasures, it takes considerable thought to arrive at the exact estimate. We thought about other comparable books and manuscripts that have sold in the past, uh, for example, uh, Codex Leicester, which is the Da Vinci Codex, the manuscript, which is now owned by Bill Gates and sold for $30 million. Thought about the Constitution, which Sotheby sold in 2021, of which there were 15 copies, sold for $43 million. Here we have a manuscript which has no equal, it has no parallels. There aren't any other early witnesses which contain this entire text. What we have here is a remarkable witness to the transmission of the most exact, accurate text of the Hebrew Bible, the divine word of God. It is more complete than any other manuscript of this period. If Codex Sassoon sells for more than $43 million, it will become the single most expensive book or manuscript ever sold. The Codex was written in the late 9th or early 10th century and likely commissioned by a wealthy patron who hired a single scribe to work on it for more than a year. Over the following centuries, a handful of the Bible's owners added records of sale to its pages, which allowed experts to trace its provenance. This book has been owned privately um, by individuals as witnessed by the deed of gift from around the year 1000. Also, it was purchased by David Solomon Sassoon in 1929, and it's also been owned by institutions such as a synagogue in Makisin around the 13th and 14th century. And what's exciting to me is we've seen both institutions and private individuals approach us and express their interest from across the world. What makes this manuscript so important is that this is the earliest extant example where we have every book of the Bible in its stable and standardized form. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain portions, sometimes only fragments of biblical texts. There's actually only one book of the entire Hebrew Bible, which is complete, and that is the Great Scroll of Isaiah. These scrolls, however, do not contain any vowel points or any cantillation marks. When these Bibles emerged, they included all the cantillation marks, which explained how one is to chant the text. And often, how you chant it, it's not just about the singing, but it's also about where you stop and where you start in a sentence, which can make all the difference in the interpretation. Perhaps most significantly, it contains the vowel points Above and below each word on the page are all the different Hebrew vowels 
that allow us to understand exactly what word is meant in every single book of the Hebrew Bible, every verse, every book of the Hebrew Bible. While this book is missing 15 out of the 929 chapters that make up the Hebrew Bible, it is essentially complete. Every single book of the Hebrew Bible is found within the 729 pages of Codex Sassoon. Despite being more than a thousand years old, the Codex Sassoon is in remarkably good condition, and it should stay that way. Its parchment pages, which were made with an estimated 200 sheepskins, can last forever if they're kept at moderate humidity, and you don't even need to wear gloves to touch it. One of the questions I'm asked is how you can turn the pages of this manuscript without gloves. Conservators around the world believe that when you put gloves on, you lose the tactility. It's much harder to turn the pages, and you might end up ripping something or bending one of the leaves in an effort to turn the pages. So current conservational thinking is that it's much better to actually turn the pages with perfectly clean hands. This book really resonates. It's, it's deeply powerful. Uh, people of many religions and faiths look at it and feel a deep connection when they open up and look at the pages and can see a millennia of the text of the Hebrew Bible sitting in front of them. It's in remarkably good condition, and we think that it could be bought either institutionally or privately or there could be private donors who wish to purchase it for an institution. I think everything is possible at this point. I think in our industry, we focus too much on the money that you can make and the opportunities that you can get for yourself. But what about the opportunities that you're creating for other people? You know, what about the money that you're putting in other people's pockets? So I just want to change that mentality within business. My name is Jile Adetunji. I am the co-founder and chief marketing officer at Guap. And I'm Ibrahim Kamara, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Guap. We run Guap, which is a youth-led digital media platform dedicated to discovering, nurturing, and showcasing emerging creative talent. We started as a magazine and wanted to tell the stories of emerging creative talent from backgrounds that were similar to ours. So I used to shoot all the videos on my camera, and they used to do all the interviews. And we literally would go around London interviewing different creatives because when we was coming up, Everyone wanted to be like footballers or rappers or you'd be doctors or accountants, but there was no platform that was profiling all the different types of creativity you can be. So we said we made it our mission to do that and actually yeah, just document creative stories. 2018 was the year that we launched our marketing agency because we realized that we had cultivated like this really cool and niche audience. And brands were really trying to tap into that at the time. So um, we started getting approached by loads of different agencies, loads of different fashion brands or wherever it might be, tech companies. Um, and they wanted to tap into our audience. I guess that's how we started making money because before that, it was really tough. <laughs> it was really tough. We went to the University of Kent. I was doing software engineering. I was, was doing kind of finance. Yeah, and uh, I had to basically do a placement year for my third year at university where I go and work in the city. I ended up doing software engineering and yeah, I hated it. It was, it was awful. I think I realized after one week that this wasn't for me. And I just thought back to my youth. I was like, okay, I really love creative things. I love drawing, I love music, I love fashion. But I also love being an entrepreneur. You know, I was that kid in school that would buy drinks from the shop and then go and sell it on the playground. So I thought, okay, maybe we can merge the two. And we just thought of a different, you know, different creative ideas as to how we can launch some sort of business that showcases creativity and is community based. A lot of media companies tend to work with talent who are already quite established and obviously understandably, but we felt like there was a massive gap in the market where it's like, if you're an emerging talent, there's nowhere that you can really go to to get support. If you are a young stylist or you're a young MUA or a young artist, we'll support you, you know, we'll do an editorial feature on you, we might book you to come and do something at one of our events and then we might bring you in to get your first client opportunity. So it's like a whole e a guap ecosystem where we're able to take a creative from working with them or like putting them on an article on our website all the way through to making them work on a big brand campaign. I think building a team has been really hard as well. Um, so we em employed our first staff 
I think during the pandemic actually, yeah, so yeah. around like 2020 or 2019. Yeah. And now we've grown, we've got about 12 or so employees. And then I guess just managing the different personalities and keeping everybody on the same page and motivated, yeah. you know, it's, it's really tough. But yeah, we'll, we'll learn it as we go along. We have kind of like been in the VC world, we kind of just dipped our toe in and like from what I've seen, I don't particularly like it just because I think the pressure that comes with, I guess, making money, we don't want to make it at any cost. You know, we, it's really important for us to, to- Integrity. Yeah, the integrity is one of our like key values as a company. So yeah, we don't want to just make profit and just leave our community behind. We want to bring our community with us and make sure that creatives in 10, 20 years still have a space where they can come to and, you know, be like a nobody and become a somebody, you know, and be recognized for their, for their talent. One of the main things that I want um, people to like remember, both of us for, is being able to come from the places we come from and being able to get to the peak of commercial success and still remaining who you are. Because I think when we first started, being an entrepreneur was men in suits. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you had to be so trim and proper, where now we feel like even opportunities like this is gonna like show young people from the areas like we're from, that yeah, you can come here, speak how you speak, dress how you dress, and still do amazing things. Yeah, basically I wanna create a way of life in which entrepreneurs and creatives have a bit more of a selfless approach to the way they do business and think about what value you can bring and what value you can give to people as opposed to just taking. So yeah, hopefully through what we're doing at Guap, we can, we can do that. And make purposeful profit. Yeah.